Good afternoon. This is Loretta Thompson, and I'm here to welcome you to Green Spoon Martyrs Innovation Week 2021, where we'll be talking in this session about buildings and how they develop immunity to forces and new realities that affect them. We're here to talk specifically about how environmental, social, and governance ESG strategies create resilience and sustainability in real estate. And what I wanna do first is welcome my panelists, Lindsay Clark and Mary Tressel. Let me tell you a little bit about them. Lindsay Clark is an ESG consultant with over 15 years of experience in marketing and sustainable development. She currently serves as communications manager for Verdani Partners, a full service sustainability consulting firm based in San Diego. And she manages their internal communications program. You can read a little bit more of her bio on our page that's up for you to look at the slide. 
but I wanted to let you know that I was very much involved uh, with the BOMA Building Owners and Management Association, the Sustainability Committee for many years, and the founding partner, Danielle Horton, uh, was on that committee. And I had the honor and the pleasure of working with her on advocating for ESG with building owners and managers way back 10, 11 years ago. So really thrilled uh, that Lindsay is here and that the firm has grown to over 30 people, 31 people, I think she told us, and that it, it's in quite demand. And she'll let you know more about that when we talk in our topics. Our second panelist is Mary Tressel, who's the strategic leader and team builder focused on delivering on Armanino's purpose to be the most innovative and entrepreneurial firm. She is with Armanino, a, a, a regional accounting company. Uh, I've worked with many of their accountants and I was really pleased to see that they actually had, you know, an ESG component to what they're trying to do to help their investors and their clients come to better social and corporate governance. And she has been spearheading the innovative corporate social responsibility initiatives, such as volunteer vacations, financial literacy, training, and virtual volunteering. And she successfully led Armanino's B Corporation certification journey to join an elite group of accounting and consulting firms who balance profits with purpose. And with that, uh, we want to talk about, in, in general, I think that it would be really useful for everyone to know more what ESG is. And I think we have a slide for that. And what it stands for, for those of you who are just getting acquainted with it, is environmental, social, and governance. And it was coined, it was a term coined in the mid-2000s. And the philosophy behind it evolved from what was commonly referred to as impact investing or socially responsible investing. It's grounded heavily in history going back 3,500 years. The practice of socially responsible or impact investing began in, US, in the US in earnest in the 1960s with investors excluding stocks and entire companies and industries from their portfolios based upon their business activities, such as tobacco production, gambling, or involvement in certain companies and even oppressive political regimes. From its earliest form, this type of investing was driven by the intention of individual investors to align social and environmental values with investment portfolios. Each of the three tenets of ESG form the main platforms that are used to measure sustainability and ethical impact of a business or company, covering a multitude of topics in every investment scale. At the, as the moment gained force, the United Nations Principle for Responsible Investment, it's called UNPRI, was released in 2006. There were 64 signatories and 45 trillion in signatories managed assets committed to ESG strategies. Even more important, in 2012, the Global Sustainable Investment Alliance, GSIA, which is a consortium of international sustainable investment organizations, distributed an inaugural issue of Global Sustainable Investment Review and it provided more impetus to the movement. As early as 2020, it was reported that there were 3,657 signatories representing 90 trillion in assets under ESG principles. So given the time we've got allotted for this webinar, we're going to kind of focus on the application of these principles and strategies to resilience and sustainability in real estate. And we have three main topics. We're not sure how many we could get through because everything has so much depth and breadth and we really wanna give you the most information we can. And, and if it 
turns out that we need to have a follow-up webinar, we'll schedule that as well uh, and, and, and have you involved in that as well. So the first, the first thing that we wanted to explore with our panelists, Lindsay and Mary, is what are the new ESG market drivers and reporting frameworks? And to talk about how priorities are shifting in real estate with owners, investors, you know, whether it's market driven, pandemic driven, tax incentive driven, you know, bottom line IR ROI. And this would address the G in ESG, the governance aspect. So I want to start with you, Lindsay. Um, why don't you start with, you know, the market driven forces and, and what your experience is and, and what you know from your experience. Sure. Thank you for the great introduction and setting the table for ESG. The moment for ESG has arrived. We have just seen so much incredible momentum. Really, I mean, since the past year, 10 years, we are seeing just a sea swell of change. And if you're reading through the keyword hits on Google these days, ESG is in the news very frequently. And so, you know, even you start to see this, especially in real estate with the 2020 um, letter from Larry Fink, who is the CEO of BlackRock. And he said, climate risk is investment risk. And that kind of statement creates waves. And so we are really seeing that investors are paying attention at a very high level and are giving this a lot of priority and a lot of focus, especially right now. And uh, this has actually been followed up with an additional update in 21 with BlackRock's 2021 stewardship expectations. Um, and that's really been uh, reshaping how we think about investment. And he's talked about things like board quality and the low carbon economy and diversity, equity, and inclusion. So these are some of the key issues that really play into the ESG landscape right now. And especially because the climate has changed, uh, literally. The climate that we are experiencing now has been destabilized. And I think in 2020, during the pandemic, we all really saw and felt and experienced how things are changing. And, and actually BlackRock reports that climate change is now the top issue that clients around the world are raising with them and they're saying, what are you gonna do about this and how can we make a difference? And so what that, what that means is that institutional investors are increasing mandates for ESG and that's forcing real estate funds to adapt. And so that's what we're seeing in our business day to day. And that's really affecting our clients. Um, for example, Goldman Sachs uh, said that the COVID-19 crisis is heightening a growing pressure to strengthen ESG requirements. And so again, this is a, in investing. So um, one of the things that's important to talk about in this field is sustainability reporting and transparency. So are you really walking the talk and are you making tangible progress? Um, can you measure it? Are you tracking it? Are you tracking your change over time? And so that's a big part of our work that we do with our clients is to make sure that they can in fact show their progress. Um, and I actually really enjoy that part of it. I help write the ESG annual reports. And so I see all the cool stuff that our clients are doing across the board. And I, I really enjoy it. I get a lot of um, satisfaction out of being part of that because communicating that to the world is, is really important. Because you know, ESG and resilience is just a huge competitive advantage right now, not only you know, from a PR perspective, but operationally to be able to prove that you are making changes means that you are ahead of the game because those people who have not implemented comprehensive ESG programs are actually already falling behind. And so we have people approaching us saying, how do we start? <laughs> and so, and that's where we can step in and help. But um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the different reporting frameworks that are out there because this is important for the audience to be aware of is that um, you can voluntarily report to organizations like GRES, which is one of the largest global real estate asset assessments, uh, PRI and CDP, those are, those are both voluntary. So the idea is that when you participate in these kinds of assessments, you're giving all kinds of information about ESG across the board. So you're reporting on your environmental initiatives and your social initiatives, how well you're doing on inclusivity, sorry, inclusivity and diversity. And then you're also looking at your governance, so your policies and how everything is working. And so then what you see is this incredible peer benchmarking that happens. And so People are kind of have this friendly competition and it's pushing the industry to higher and higher levels of performance. 
And so organizations that have been doing this for 10 years plus are, are really excelling and they have this additional level of resilience that is so important in light of things like the pandemic, which has really reshaped our world. Um, and then on the other side of the coin, you have involuntary reporting frameworks. So this is MSCI, ISS ESG, Sustainalytics and Bloomberg ESG. So these are kind of the four like kind of big ones that are involuntary. And so if you are a publicly listed company and your information is available online, they are assessing you whether or not you've asked to be. <laughs> they are looking up your information, they're, they're coming up with a report, and then you have the chance to review it and make any corrections as needed. But ultimately you are on the radar. And so these organizations are gonna to wanna to start paying attention to how they are being assessed because that is affecting perception, not only from the public, but also from the investors. So um, really, I Thank think- you. <laughs> I know. I wanted to, just, wanted to highlight one thing, uh, Lindsay, that you said, and, and it is to put the highlight on the word voluntary, right? Voluntary, and, and the other one was peer pressure. So I, I find it astounding that so many companies are doing this voluntarily despite all the pushback uh, and some of the climate denial issues that are going on out there. So regardless, the very conservative companies really embracing it. It's true. It, I think that um, in a way there, some of them are getting pushed into it to embracing it um, because their peers are doing it and they're falling behind. Um, and then the other side of it is it's good business. Um, so, if we, for example, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, SASB, they help businesses across all kinds of sectors to look at the financial impacts on their sustainability initiatives. And so it has a tangible dollar figure that can be associated with this kind of thing. And we can talk later about um, some of those positive impacts that we've seen and are measurable. But ultimately, ESG is on the rise and it's here to stay. Well, thank you. That's really, uh, that's really uh, eye-opening because I, I quite frankly I'm in the I'm in the real estate space all day long and I haven't seen it put together so succinctly and clearly as you've got it here and it, a lot more is coming out on this now people are writing about this as a result of the pandemic we'll talk a little bit later about how the pandemic has impacted it um, now Mary you have a different take on it but it's the same message and it, you're coming from a governance issue where you're assisting your clients and investors with what are they going to do and how do we account for this? Would you talk to your points on that? Yeah, I think I think what's really what has been the um, the past of ESG it has been environmental for the most part, right? Everybody's really focused on the environmental, and even when the SEC. Um, adopts rules around this and, and puts out some guidance later this year, which we are expecting, it will lead with the environment. That is the number one, as Lindsay said, the climate is changing. It is the number one consideration, particularly from a risk um, exposure area. But there's also really the people side of it. And that's the S and the G part, the social and governance areas. And Armanino as the 21st largest accounting firm in the nation, you know, we've got offices across the nation. What we found is we were, we were kind of doing good. We knew we were trying to make this positive impact on our clients and our people in our communities, but we didn't necessarily think that people outside of our firm knew that. And when, when, when we came across the B Corporation movement, we decided this is, this is where we needed to be. So it is the, um, it's a very large and intense, um, verifiable rating of your company. They really go through your uh, statistics with a fine tooth comb to make sure that you are meeting those transparency requirements, um, that you are making a positive impact on your clients. You're, you're, the work you're doing does have an impact on the client and you're measuring that, um, that you are working with your community and uh, on, the, on the diversity and inclusion uh, activities that you are doing. So we just really, uh, really embraced that. And what we found was that this had a huge impact on our newest employees. Those who have just come out of college, they, they knew more about it. They were so excited um, for Armenia to become a B Corp. And I think that's what we wanna share with our client base, right? That there is this real brand building and recruiting and retention ROI that you can get from, from focusing on your ESG. 
um, metrics. So, you know, it's, it's uh, we, we're talking metrics, but it has this real human impact. And, and when you think about real estate, the, all those buildings are occupied by people. <laughs> so you wanna make sure you're having that positive impact on people. Um, so I hope that answered the question better. Yeah, it does. Um, so, I mean, we talked a little bit, you talked about the certified B corporation. I'm not sure that everyone knows what that's about. Um, maybe you could just, you talked also briefly about, well, it's, it's a difficult process to go through. Um, who, who monitors that? And, and what kind of companies, all companies can become involved and become a B corporation? Why don't you talk a little bit about that and, and who the monitoring um, companies are on that? Yes, yeah, so their, their standards board is called B-Lab. This is an international organization. They have almost 4,000 companies now who have become certified B Corps, but they've had 50,000 people run through their assessment and, and see how do they stack up against their competitors. So uh, it is every for-profit company, B-Lab does not evaluate nonprofit organizations. So anyone who is making a profit um, runs through this process. And it's really the highest standards, verifiable social, environmental, and and governance um, performance. So the questionnaire has over 200 um, ways that you are evaluated and you provide backup documentation for all of that. And so there's a team at the lab that reviews it all, makes sure that what you are claiming is what is true. So it, it, they really stand to try and um, eliminate greenwashing, which is part of the investment issue here too, because you can see a company um, in a rating agency and it may have an e, a high ESG score, but it's because maybe they have, um, as you said, it's voluntary, Lindsay. So maybe they have left off where they are not scoring well. So that's why the SEC wants to get involved as well is to make sure when, when people are claiming high ESG scores that they are actually verifiable. So B-Lab does that for, okay. for these companies. And some names that you would recognize that are B-Labs, uh, Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream, Patagonia, the Clothier, um, Fetzer Vineyards here in California. They are the, they were the first winery, but actually there are a lot of wineries that are, are now B Corps. Um, so CPG um, are definitely in there. There are real estate companies. There are 19 real estate firms and investment firms that are, are um, certified B Corps. So I think that there's an opportunity for growth in this industry. If you're doing well, if you're one of Lindsay's clients and you've already been doing well, then you could become a certified B Corp and, and get that extra stamp of approval. Well, that, that's very interesting. And, and maybe I'll take it back to Lindsay for a minute before we go on to the next point. Um, Lindsay, of all of the companies um, that you're working with on this, are you seeing a balance between you know large, large corporations for profits and smaller mom and pop companies buying into ESG and pursuing its its policies and framework? That question, yeah. I mean, I think that it it has a, there's a range. For example, our clients are predominantly large real estate portfolios, so they own hundreds of buildings. Some of them globally. Um, but some of them are, for example, mul um, residential, so multifamily residential. And so all of that, it, it just plays out a little bit differently. But I think that you especially see a lot of pressure within the REIT space. And um, I'm not, it'll be interesting to see how it trickles down the small mom and pops. But it is good business. And I think the pandemic, again, is in emphasizing having yeah. these kinds of policies in place makes you more resilient. Right. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very insightful and helpful for all the people here who are listening or will be listening who are investors in real estate. It's it, and what you're saying is it's for everybody and uh, and everyone's taking notice and maybe the REITs and the large multinational companies are are first in the space as as they dedicate resources to it. But it's coming for everybody. So. Um, the next topic we wanted to kind of dovetail into from this is another G government a governance aspect called why investors care. And Mary, why don't we start with you about why you believe investors care? Right. And we just, I shared an article this morning. It was in commercial real yeah. estate, a publication this morning. They said ESG is here to stay. And it's actually, it's because that's where the money is. So people are trying to uh, vote with their dollars and they want to make sure that where they're putting their money, 
um, is verified that it is good for the environment and their communities. Um, and the other thing is that it's really a long-term play in real estate, right? It, um, if you're a company like Armadino and we lease our buildings, we could choose to lease wherever we want to. But if you're the owner of that building, you can't just pick up and move your building and, or you know, do a, do a quick um, makeover and expect to be able to get the scores that you need. So we see it uh, for, for real estate, the in real estate industry as a, a competitive advantage when you invest in ESG, because um, a lot of people are, they wanna work in buildings that they know are healthy. They wanna live in buildings that they know are healthy. And in fact, one of our, our uh, consultant friends was sharing with me, he's working on a project at USC, University of Southern California. And it's this mixed use, brand new student housing. It's, it's quite a big plot that they're working on. And as they're going through the process, and COVID hit, they decided we're gonna invest more in our HVAC. We're gonna make sure that um, the ventilation systems are top of the line because when a parent is deciding where they're gonna spend their dorm and you know room and board dollars for their child, are they gonna to go to that old dorm that's across the street that hasn't been updated in 15, 20 years? Or are they gonna go into the brand new one where they know that their child is safe? And from the kid's perspective, they've seen their older you know, friends or um, family members go off and they've had to be in single room dorms, right? They haven't had the dorm experience. They haven't had the roommate. They haven't been able to get into each other's dorms and hang out um, during this pandemic. So wherever the real estate uh, industry can invest in improving ventilation and, and making buildings healthier, I know that Lindsay's gonna talk about well building soon. That's where there's this big competitive advantage and that's where the dollars come into play as well. Okay, that's that's really helpful. Uh, yeah, I, excellent point. Uh, the dorm experience is really an excellent point, especially, and that's been going on for some time. Um, I remember way back when I was in college, uh, students were fighting to get into the dorms that had new ventilation. And so, and of course the investors, you know, the demand was just off the charts for better living spaces, healthier living spaces. Some dorms, even uh, my understanding, like Pitzer College went to net zero way long ago. So, you know, you, you just see that it's, it's where the demand is. And especially with younger people, they understand the difference and the well building issue. So that brings us to Lindsay. Uh, talking about this enormous demand for the services that her firm has been offering since the pandemic and, and why that demand has taken off. Sure. You know, it was very scary uh, when the pandemic hit because over the last 10 years or so, um, sustainability in the early days was kind of like a nice to have, you know, kind of like an optional or an add on. And in previous budget cuts, sometimes sustainability programs really took a hit. And so we just didn't really know what the fallout would look like, but it has been just so inspiring and um, given us a lot of peace of mind to see that organizations have really doubled down on their ESG programs. And it makes a lot of sense, you know, because uh, from a resilience perspective, it gives you more operational cost savings, it gives you better PR, it helps you hold your market value. There's a lot of reasons why ESG has been sticking around. And I will say that, you know, we've, we've actually grown from being a small sized consulting firm to now a medium sized company as of Q1, 2021. Um, it's very exciting. And there's been just a huge demand in the market for skilled professionals who understand ESG because it's so multifaceted. There's so many things you have to understand to really do ESG work. And it's not in a silo anymore. It touches so many different departments. And so it's, um, it's a very, imagine doing training with our company. <laughs> and it's, it's really intense. It's like drinking from a fire hose because there's so much to learn. But, um, you know, the proof is in the pudding and the numbers. If you look at like a recent, recent Morningstar study uh, out right. of 745 European ESG funds, they outperformed the non-ESG funds over one, three, five, and 10 year period of time. So it's organizations that have these kinds of, of investments in ESG are better prepared. And um, I think that a great example, like you know, we've been talking about buildings and dorm rooms and you know, organizations that already have been thinking about green cleaning, 
with products that are good for your health. Um, if you're looking at indoor air quality filters, like having high quality MERV filters that can actually catch particulate matter like the virus, all of this kind of work has already been included for previous ESG certifications. Um, so buildings that already have this have already been upgraded and they're already kind of ready to go. So when disaster strikes, you're not having to start from scratch and say, oh my gosh, you have to start caring about occupant health. We already do. And the social piece is also really important. I think, like Mary said, you, know, you have to have people who are living in these buildings. And um, the people are actually what's emerging um, at, in ESG with, during this crisis. The social and the governance are getting way more attention now because like we've seen with the social justice movement that we're going through, that this inclusion and diversity piece is so important to a healthy functioning society. And we need to have, we need to have programs that really back that up. And so um, organizations that already have a head start, fabulous. You know, they're, on, they're right on their way. Um, so I, I think that it really is just proving it's worth time and time again. Yeah, that's that. I, I see that happening more and more, and you're absolutely right. And and the, the the article that was forwarded to us by Mary today is is very instrumental in that. And maybe uh, we can find a way to get that uh, link to people so that they can also read it. Um, and then moving on just a little bit from that, we'll talk about here some some of the organizations. And, and benchmarking companies and all that that have been really highly involved for some time. I, one of them is LEAD. May, and Mary, why don't you speak to LEAD? Right, well, actually this um, webinar is bringing my career a little full circle because about 15, <laughs> 20 years ago, I was working with architects uh, in Emeryville, which is near Berkeley. And uh, they're very focused on sustainable design and really kind of um, cradle to grave uh, design and making sure that uh, the, the um, footprint was as light as possible. So LEED, LEED has been around much longer than, than the term ESG. And so I think many people in the real estate industry understand that about the leadership in energy and environmental design movement. Um, but really what the, um, as an accounting and consulting firm, what we see are the kind of the tax breaks that you can achieve by participating and, and making sure that your buildings are, um, <coughs> pardon me, are environmentally, um, at the, at the top of their game. And so some of those are new markets, renewable energy, um, in low-income housing, and also historic rehabilitation. So those are all tax credits. Again, you know, we, we, think, we think about the humans that are um, living in these buildings, but also the, the real bottom line uh, relief that you can get from that. And I've also been on uh, volunteering for many years with a, a homeless uh, organization group that's trying to end chronic homelessness in Contra Costa County. And really the housing first movement is where we will go if we are going to improve the world's homeless um, challenges, especially in the US. And so low income housing is a great investment these days. And there's a lot of incentive out there um, to get involved in that. So from a tax perspective and also um, you know, just other government incentives to get that going. So that those are the things I would like to say about that. The last, the last piece of it though, when Armenia was going through our B Corp certification, one of the challenges we had as a, as a lessee of a building is we couldn't get all of the environmental statistics and, and detailed data that the B Corporation um, needed in order to, to evaluate us. So we went, we went to our landlords, we said, this is the information we need. And that's not how they prepare their invoices for their tenants. And so I think there may start to be a demand from, um, you know, from the, the renters and the, the tenants of these buildings asking for more detailed environmental information so that they can report on these different matrices and, and achieve the points they want. So I think that's another reason why um, real estate investors and, and property owners should, should be prepared for this. That, that brings to mind um, some recent experience I've had, well, maybe over the past couple of years, and I don't know if you guys all remember the benchmarking law, the California benchmarking law, where we tried to get building owners responsible for providing data on their energy usage. Mm -hmm. The biggest obstacle I ran into, ironically, was the tenants themselves who did not want to report their energy usage or to be pointed out <laughs> what was going on with their energy usage. And so we had to rewrite 
uh, put amendments into leases and in new leases, put in provisions that obligated them to sustainability measures. A uh, couple of, it started out with a couple of paragraphs and, and now we have leases that have viable green leaning paragraphs that, that obligate the, the tenants in partnership with the landlord mm -hmm. to monitor their energy usage and disclose it. Uh, and Lindsay, do you have anything to say about that issue? Yeah, I do actually. We, we do work with our clients to establish green leasing policies. If they don't already have them, like you said, it's important to get them so that you can collect the right numbers. And um, I think we have seen some pushback overall it looks like this is the trend going forward because you do, you have to have the ability to access the data. And then you also need to look at that as an important part of tenant engagement and education. If that's a big part of behavior change is being able to connect with them, help them to see their impact on a personal level and then add that up collectively and look at it from a bigger picture is what we're trying to achieve as an organization, as a planet. So um, it, it, it all matters. Yeah. Well does. That brings us to uh, another topic we want to discuss, uh, the e, uh, environmental part of ESG, which would be climate risk and accountability through reporting. Uh, so we'll start with Lindsay, because this is going to refer to activities and methods that are used by individuals, organizations, and in institutions to facilitate climate resilient decision making. Absolutely. So climate risk management is just so critical as part of where we stand right now in history. Uh, we are now experiencing the effects of climate change. And so we need to really get clear on physical, social, and transition risks, um, very much in line with the TCFD framework, so that we can predict the challenges that we'll face and then we'll, all be, we'll also be prepared to respond. So that's a lot of the work that we do, actually, at Verdani Partners is we help our clients to really assess across the board what their potential impacts might be. And everything from um, like, for example, if we look at physical risks, this could be something like predicting disruption to building operations. So building sites that are in a flood zone or in a fire area, what do they need to have in place such as the right insurance plans and the kind of flood protection barriers? Um, we do work with clients to make sure that they have um, a, a clear plan in place, even down to the social risks, such as like a clear communications plan for tenants. So how are you going to get the word out when things happen? If things go, things go down, what are you going to do? So um, <laughs> I have a little visitor here. Okay, thank you. Sophia. Um, and then I think just to round that out, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, just the education piece of it, because when you first understand your risks, you've got to make sure that gets down into the operational levels of the organization so that you are prepared comprehensively. So you really, and it's not just a private sector approach or a public sector, it's really both. And you have to have your people working together to kind of create these solutions so that we can move forward. Excellent. Um, we were talking uh, in the last sec segment a little bit about uh, LEAD and all the other um, you know, reporting agencies that do assess ESG. And, and, and Mary, talk about which ones you find are the most popular and, and what you're seeing with your clients. Yeah, so it's the, it's the GRESBY, it's the GRI, it's LEAD. We're seeing those for sure. And we're also seeing that 70% um, of institutional real estate investors are focused on ESG and those who are not are planning to get there. So the, the, as we said, it's just the, this is where we're going. Um, we actually had a, a futurist come in and do a presentation for Armenia and he talked about how things move slowly and then all of a sudden they move really rapidly. And I think the US has been a little bit behind, has been a lot behind the EU. So in the EU, it's our, we're already on that rapid curve. And I think what we're going to see this year and next year in the United States is the, the rapid curve for everyone who wants to invest in ESG and make demands um, of the corporations that they work with. Again, it's a, it also comes back to brand building and, and uh, people want to work with people that they respect and have this transparency. They can't, can't expect transparency from 
And that's what ESG reporting will do for your organization as well as to, to let you um, put forth your good news <laughs> and what and the efforts that you're doing to, to be a good corporate citizen, right? You want to balance that purpose and profits. That's what B Corps are about. Purpose and profit. And, and so what we'll, we'll have um, Lindsay talk a little bit about the one of the more prominent um, uh, associations and its resilience model, Gresby. And uh, because that, that one is widely used in risk management assessments. So uh, Lindsay, why don't you take it from there? Yeah, I think the resilience module of GRESB is really exciting because it's, it's helping to look at that climate risk management and get into tactical strategies very specifically. So it was launched in 2018 and it, was, it kind of started out as like a voluntary participation. And um, this year, actually, it has been incorporated into the main assessment. And so really what's exciting about that is, is that it's becoming more institutionalized, that resilience is being taken very seriously. And there's some real concrete numbers behind it to help you measure it. And so we've actually been doing these resilience um, assessment, resilience module with our clients for the last three years. And in 2020, um, 23 out of our 31 funds that reported actually ranked number one. So meaning they performed really, really well across those different measures. Because when you have those programs in place, you can kind of earn that type of score. So we're, we're proud of our clients. And we also know that there's a lot more to go. <laughs> it is, it's a long way to go in terms of really being ready for the risks that we have to face. Um, but to just give you a few examples of what that might look like, um, the biggest difference in the GRES resilience module this year is that they're really aligning with the TCFD framework. So that just shows the amount of collaboration that's happening in the industry and that these, these uh, standards are looking to really align and make it easier for organizations to be in compliance. And so um, they really are looking actually at the physical and transition risks and they dropped the social. But you know, for Verdani's side, we, we wanted to emphasize that we actually really highly value the social piece and health and well-being because it's all connected. And so we continue to keep a focus on health and well-being and healthy buildings um, as part of our work going forward. Great, great. Uh, and, and, and Mary, you, you know, to further get into this a little bit about, you know, what, what experts are predicting about international reporting requirements, what, what do you see in that? Right, so the International Financial Reporting Standards Boards, the IFRS, um, SASB has joined in with IFRS. And so we are expecting, um, we heard from the AICPA, uh, the, the um, American Institute of uh, CPAs uh, CEO, he said, you know, things don't move that fast internationally, but we're seeing really fast movement on this. And so there's a lot of um, support from our, the US SEC. Uh, for this combination of IFRS and SASB, and we really think that there's going to be um, some requirements, reporting requirements coming out within this calendar year is actually what we're seeing. Um, and the, the recently confirmed SEC chair, he said that ESG disclosure rulemaking is one of his top priorities um, and climate risk and uh, ESG disclosures are material because a growing number of investors are demanding that information. So. So again, people want to see transparency. We've lived through a very hard year and a half of, of kind of not knowing what's coming next. And so where, where we can <laughs> have transparency, uh, we want it. And so that's, that's what the SEC is responding to and all these organizations. So I think, it's, I think it's great that Lindsay is keeping her clients focused on the full picture and, and not just one part of that pie. Oh, thank you so much. Now, it looks like we're running out of time. We are going to be uh, four minutes to go, and I don't see any um, requests in the chat room uh, for anything. Uh, let me see. Oh, Anana's. Ah, here's a question. Are commercial tenants driving sustainability innovation? Uh, uh, do you want to speak to that, um, Lindsay, and see, you know, based on your experience? Uh, I mean, I, I do think that we see a lot of innovation happening right now in the industry. Everything from high performance initiatives to ways that we are tracking sustainability. Um, the technology is, is just incredible that's, that's emerging right now. Um, but I think that on the pandemic side, 
I want to speak to the social innovation that happened. Yeah. Um, yes. I think that we see tremendous collaboration between landlords and stakeholders uh, and tenants. We see a lot more um, of creative problem solving and um, it's just really changing the way that we, that we work together. So, um, so yes, I think there is a lot of innovation happening and it'll be really exciting to see what the next 10 years brings because already the landscape has changed dramatically. Right, right. So this leaves us, we have a, another couple of topics that we could cover um, given the time. So, you know, from there we would move on to talk about, you know, viral response models. And I suggest that we schedule a follow-up webinar in a month and, and also uh, like weigh in on what, what is coming out of it. Uh, there's more and more reporting coming out of the viral response. And, and then talk a little bit next time about how buildings uh, foster immunity and promote resilience. As you all know, I was an asset manager before I was a lawyer and I, uh, I believe that buildings are living, breathing organisms. And so, uh, you know, you have to look to your building and, and how it can help you when you're in your goals to foster immunity and, and social uh, governments, uh, governance issues. So with that, um, I guess if there's no other questions, I guess that's it. And I thank you all for attending. I appreciate my, my co-panelists, Lindsay and Mary, and, um, and I'm very grateful to them for their expertise and very grateful to anyone who was viewing this. Thank you. Thank you, Loretta.